Hello, everyone, and welcome to May 2015 webinar, Naked Reporting, Shedding the Narrative. Our regulars will notice that today's webinar is shorter than usual. This was intentional, so do not adjust your set. If any of you have an answer to the question at the bottom of this slide, go ahead and type it into that chat box over there on the left-hand side of your screen. I am Jason Burkhardt, and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate, and Emma Perk, Evaluate's Project Manager. Evaluate is the Evaluation Resource Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. Please do note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. We'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the behind-the-scenes contributions of Mike Lasecki and Janet Pinhorn at Maytech Networks. This webinar has been created for individuals that are involved or interested in NSF's ATE program. For those of you who are not familiar with that program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education, and of course, NSF is how we refer to the National Science Foundation. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. Most of what we'll be discussing today, though, will be applicable beyond the ATE program. The slides and handout from today's webinar are available on our website. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll email you the link for the recording when it's available. This commonly takes about one to two days. So raise your hand if you've used the Blackboard system before. OK, great. There's a number of people that are regulars or that, have, that are returning. But for those of you that are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. Notice the hand icon above the participant window. To raise your hand, just click that icon. You'll also notice the participant box on the left side of the screen. This box lists everyone that's attending this webinar. Just below the participants box is the chat. Today's presentation will be divided into three main sections with a question break after each. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box. We'll address them during those question and answer breaks. Why don't we try using the chat box now? Please type the name of your organization you're from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you. All right, great. It looks like people know how to use the chat box. We'll be doing some polls during the webinar today as well. To respond to a poll, do not use the chat box. Instead, select one of the letters in the drop-down menu above the list of participants. Let's practice a poll now. As some of you guessed, it was an earthquake that happened in Michigan at the beginning of May. So the poll question is, what was the magnitude of the 2015 Michigan earthquake? You can use those poll buttons above the chat box to answer 1.8, 3.7, 4.2, or 6.5. All right, we've got several people answering as we go. Okay, Mike, if we can display the results of the poll, please. So it looks like the common answers were B and C. Uh, 4.2 magnitude on the Richter scale was correct. Uh, it was quite a little bit of a shaker over here. Uh, the none reflects people that um, may not have answered the poll. We'll also be using the marker tool today. The marker may be accessed by clicking on the marker pen icon to the right of the participants box. Your cursor will change and you will be able to write on the screen. Let's go ahead and try that now. On this map, indicate your location using the marker tool. If you're joining us from outside the United States, make your mark off the coast in the direction of your location. Okay. So we've got some Michigan, South Carolina, North Carolina over there, New York, New Mexico, uh, Washington, Virginia, Florida, Utah. Great. So people from all over the country. 
Looks like people know how to use Blackboard. So I'll move on. Our presenters today will be talking about how to develop and take care of your project resume. And they'll also talk about how to produce attractive and informative project fact sheets. This will help you to strip down your reporting to cover the bare essentials of your work. Note that Lori will uh, be up first uh, from 105 until about 120. The second section will begin at 125. And the third section will begin at 139, in case you have to step away for a moment. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Lori Wingate. We'll talk about Project Resume Basics. Thanks, Lori. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, so in this first part of the webinar, I'm going to review the basics of Project Resumes. <coughs> Excuse me, what, what they are, why you might want to have one, and how to create one. So I've been on both sides of this in terms of on the evaluation side and the leadership side of projects. And from both perspectives, I really, really love project resumes. And as should become clear as we progress in this webinar, a well-maintained project resume is really a painless and efficient way of keeping track of project activities and achievements. I am a big fan of these types of documents, and I hope at the end of this webinar you will be too. You might be wondering what we're even talking about. This what we're even talking about and why this topic is worthy of a webinar. Um, the title of the webinar, as you know, is called Naked Reporting, Shedding the Narrative. We could have called it, um, quote, BS-free reporting, uh, because this type of reporting is really about showcasing the facts about a project. Sometimes a heavily narrative report can actually make it difficult for a reader to recognize project achievements. Even worse, it, sometimes, I don't I, Maybe this has happened to you. You've come across reports that actually intentionally use narrative to camouflage a lack of achievement. I just want to make sure, though, before we move on, everyone understands that just because I'm advocating for this as one means of reporting does not mean I am saying we need to we're going to abandon traditional narrative reports altogether. Just to be clear. So next, I'm going to share some examples of the type of narrative that could be shed for a more direct style of reporting on active project activities and achievements. And these examples I'm going to share are from real reports. They're not from ATE program. And I have modified them a little bit to remove identifying information. And I know you're fully capable of reading on your own, but um, for the benefit of those who are for, cert, for sure, some of our multitasking during this webinar, and to avoid some dead air, I'm going to go ahead and read them to you. Um, the first says, the three upper level students are currently working with Professor Snow on a variety of research topics. Professor Stone has at least one, has at least two active graduate students working with him. A graduate student, oh, on occasion, Professor Pike has students working with him. And a graduate student is working with Professor Hill. Example two says, our largest planned event for the year is Tech Day. For the past three years, we have hosted this event with great success, and here will be no exception. We have already identified several partners who will be key to making this event, this year's events, full of entertainment and educational opportunities. Planning meetings are underway, and more partners are currently being contacted for help with resources, planning, and funding. One more short example, which just states, the project director is currently in the process of connecting with community leaders as well as department chairs. This is pretty common kind of text you'll see in, in reports like this, sort of annual reporting kinds of things. So in this part of the webinar, I'm going to cover what the what, why, and how of project resumes. And after a question break, we'll review who, when, and where. Basically, a project resume is a factual account of what a project is and does. It provides succinct documentation about a project performance. So this is an image um, of evaluates of our center's resume. And we started in year one of our grant. And now we're near the end of our seventh year, and our resume is up to 14 pages. So I'm going to walk you through our resume to give you a sense of the type of information that we include in ours. Right up front, we present what we're all about. That's basically our mission and goals. And you could also include a vision statement, objectives, anything like that, as long as you can keep it short and to point. We show our resources in terms of our NSF funding and our staffing level. 
And projects that have multiple funding sources could list those here as well. And showing the funding and the staffing kind of provides a context for people who want to use the resume as a way to assess productivity in relation to the resources that are being um, put towards the effort. The bulk of our resume lists our activities. These could also be called our deliverables. It's basically whatever you want to call your tangible verified project outputs. And these are not things that are under development. It's what we've done, and there's evidence out there in the world that, that we've done it. So here, I've zoomed in on a section so you can see all the items are listed in a consistent reference style. I just thought I'd throw that in there. So we fi follow the style manual of the American Psychological Association, but it doesn't really matter what you use as long as it's consistent and all those key pieces of information are there. Putting it in a formal, consistent reference style makes it really easy to copy and paste these entries into other documents like other article manuscripts, annual reports, even personal resumes. When you start to have multiple deliverables of the same type, it's good to start grouping them by category so that information is easier to digest. As you can see here, we separated the listings for our conference posters um, and our roundtables. And this is just one, one page many. And what I think is really important, a really important part of our resume is the personnel section. So as you would expect, we list our project staff and members of our National Visiting Committee, but we also list all our contributors, collaborators, consultants, and we group them by their type of contribution or involvement. And since partnering with others in the ATE community is actually part of our mission, our list of external contributors is pretty extensive. So you can see um, the list starts with, I'm trying to get the right pointer here, our, our blog contributors. And then we list the members of our community college liaison panel, our external evaluator, um, and the individuals who have contributed to our newsletter. Then we have a few folks who have helped with our roundtables, and we have a nice long list of people who have presented at our webinars, like this one. So we have 36 people over 32 webinars, at least the last time I checked. And then on the last page, we have a variety of other types of contributions. And I really find this to be compelling evidence of the extent to which we're engaging members of the ATE community and others. And a quick glance shows a long and diverse list of people. Now, writing that up would kind of make for ter tedious writing as well as reading. Um, so here we have all the information, just bare bones facts. So now I want to go back to those three report excerpts I showed you earlier. So here's the first one, um, whose I said the narrative, some of this narrative could be shed and to expose the facts. So I want to uh, put you on the spot here. So use the chat box and say what facts from this text could we pull out and put into a resume? And you might have to add more details, I realize, but what are some of the, the the, whole, the, the facts here, the tangible things that have been done that we might be able to pull out in a resume and inform that, you know, I showed you the example from Evaluate's resume. So folks are saying the number of students, number of professors involved, the research topics, um, someone suggesting to list the project titles, yep, and for professors. Right, you've identified the facts as basically which professors are working with which students and maybe on what. So in a resume, it, I think it would be good to include the actual names of the students in a, in a form, it's something like this. Um, if we just added in the students' names, their status and major, uh, along with the names of the professors who are mentoring, and it would just look like something like this. And I think this is a much more substantial way of presenting the, this information than saying just, quote, a graduate student works with Professor Hill. And as someone mentioned in the chat, wouldn't it be cool if it also identified their, the project titles, the research, or, or whatever it is that they're working on? So as you can see, it's all laid out here, and there's no need for wordsmithing or anything like that. It's just the bare facts about what students are working with which professors. It really gets to the point, I think. So here's the second example. So again, are there any facts lurking in this text that we could show off in a resume? 
Oh, and bonus points to Kristen. She identified my secret Game of Thrones theme. So what do you think we could pull out of this narrative to put into a resume? Christine is pointing out there's been three tech, tech days, and we could show the names of the partners, the dates of the event, um, could provide a bulleted list of the highlights, what's the purpose and the partners. Yeah, you, you get it. So I'll show you one way this could be presented. So you can see we just have a bit of narrative to explain what the event is, and then we have a date, and it clearly shows that it started in 2012 and that it's an annual event. And if you recall, the narrative said the project was hosted, um, quote, with great success. So I've actually included, if one measure of, it, of success is the number of it, attendees, I've presented those here so you can see steady growth over the years. And then in the contributors section of the resume, we could show the Tech Day sponsors and, and show the other ways that they've contributed to the project. So again, I find this a more, um, more compelling than so these kind of unsubstantiated claims about success and partner involvement. So one more. What about this statement? Is there anything here we could put in a resume? Anything? Okay, yeah, which leaders? Name names. Who are they? Which chairs? Right. So this is pretty vague. So I didn't find, I wasn't very successful in, in finding anything we could pull out of here. Um, and it's, there really isn't much that's resume ready in this. So I would say this is something you'd, for a resume, you would want to wait until you have something concrete to share. What commitments have been made? Who's on board? What's their role? Is, you know, is, have you formed an advisory panel? It's not quite concrete enough. So let's consider why we might want to invest time in doing this sort of report. So it feels like I, in the last 20 plus years, I have written countless reports. Um, and it's really not my favorite thing to do, but it is really important to show accountability for what you've done with project resources. And compared with writing an entirely narrative report, creating a resume is pretty painless, especially when you start at the beginning of a project. It makes for a convenient repository of information that you're going to need to report in other places, like for us, NSF annual reports, or maybe reports you've prepared uh, for your department chair or dean. Uh, I find myself copying information from our project resume when I'm updating my personal data. It's an easy way to update an advisory panel or evaluators or others who need to keep tabs on what you're up to. And it provides a complete historical record for the project, which is especially valuable for projects that continue over multiple grants. So I want to consider these first two points more closely. They really go hand in hand. And project resumes are especially helpful at annual reporting time, which is right about now if you're funded through NSF's ATE program like we are. So this is the menu you see when you go into the annual reporting section of research.gov. And that's the online system that ATE grantees and others funded by NSF use to report to NSF. And one of the first things you need to do is to list your goals, objectives, and activities. So your resume should include the most current versions of these. And you can just copy and paste the information into your report. In the products section, you're asked for your publications, presentations, and other products. And it's so convenient just to be able to pull this directly from your resume. And if you've kept it up to date, you don't have to waste any time going through your files to compile a complete list. And you can be sure that you didn't forget anything. Finally, you're asked to list everyone who's worked at least a month on your project, along with any collaborators. Again, this is all conveniently documented in your project resume. I also include a link to our resume online so that if our uh, program officer wants to review it, um, she can. And I'm currently working on a proposal for a third round of funding, and I'm certainly going to, to reference our, our resume there. Now, there's no guarantee that proposal reviewers will look at that kind of supplementary document, but it's certainly there if they're interested. Project resumes are really a great way to update stakeholders on what your project is up to, gives them the facts, and then you can use your valuable meaning time to delve into topics that need more discussion and dialogue. In fact, we started our project resume because the chair of our National Visiting Committee, Nick Smith, recommended it to help keep the committee updated 
on our activities. Just it's, an, it's a way to be kind to your advisors and evaluators and other stakeholders, providing them succinct, complete documentation. Um, thinking of evaluators specifically, I know that trying to piece together all of a project's activities and accomplishments can be a daunting task if that information hasn't been pulled together already. And it's really not what external evaluators are there to do. And it's tedious to wade through websites and reports and newsletters, and press releases, whatever the documentation is, to construct that complete picture of what a project has accomplished. Finally, uh, project resumes are wonderful tools for supporting organizational memory. A well-maintained resume is really a complete historical record of a project's key activities and deliverables. So even if PIs or institutions change, the project resume can be just handed off. And if it's been well-maintained, none of that memory, that organizational memory, is lost in the transition. So creating your own project resume is pretty simple, as you might imagine from what you've seen so far. And we've made it even simpler by creating a project resume checklist. So to get started, you just want to download our checklist. It looks like this. It was developed by Emma Perk, who will be up a little bit later in the webinar. And it's a guide to help projects create their own resumes. And it's not a template, so you can just omit categories that don't apply to you and focus on the ones that do. And you can really tailor it to make it work for you. So in the checklist, Emma explains the main point of each section and presents checkpoints as possible elements to include in each section. And after you've got a first draft, you can share it with stakeholders and invite their feedback. Um, and in case you're wondering what you may, might do if you don't feel like you have enough information for a resume, Emma is going to be up a little later to talk about a different type of this naked report, a project fact sheet. But first, we're going to have a question break. So I will turn things over to Jason now. OK, great. Thanks, Lori. So we're at our first question and answer break. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box right now. We already had one, which I'm going to direct to Lori, and that is, do you ever convert your reports, your resumes, to press releases? Like, for example, working with your college marketing department. Any advice? I have not personally done that, but I think that's a wonderful example of what you can do. Um, that's doing press releases is something we've often talked about and never moved forward with. But I think that's an excellent example. And um, I would encourage, like, when you get evaluation results, those can be transformed into um, press releases as well. Yeah, it's just okay. one, of, one of many communication tools, I think. Do all federal agencies, including NSF, readily accept the project resume format in place of a narrative report? No, and that speaks to one of the early points I made, that this doesn't replace a native report. You still, like for us, funded by NSF, we still have to go into research.gov and complete those sections online and, and do what they ask for. What, this, what the resume really does, though, is makes that process so much easier because you don't have, your, your history is right there. Here's the publications we did. Here's who we worked with. Here's who's on our staff and so forth. So it's very convenient. So I would definitely treat it as a supplement to a narrative report, uh, not a replacement. Um, okay, so somebody asked if you could share the example resume that you showed. Um, sure, I will ask. We're actually going to. I'm going to show you where it is on our website. So I'll, I'll encourage you to check it out after the webinar. But our our resume is posted um, publicly on our website, and you're going to see where that is in just a minute. So who takes the lead on doing the project resume? That's an excellent question, which we're going to get to in the next section as well. Is there any way of incorporating evidence of quality of accomplishments? Um, hey, that's a really good question. And I think what, hap what I would advise, and I think you can tailor these kinds of documents to do whatever you need them to do. But it really is a factual account. It's not getting an impact. 
it's not so much getting at outcomes. It's what the tan. It's really about outputs. It's who did you work with? What did you create? What did you do? Very factual. Now, so that and that speaks to the needs. You still have to have separate evaluation reports that gets at those, you know, at impact data and so forth. Emma's going to show an example in her section of what we're calling a fact sheet, which actually does incorporate a little bit of evaluation data, but it's a different kind of document. For this, for what I'm calling a resume, I would keep it, keep that stuff out of it, and just stick to, you know, the tangible outputs. Okay, and. Um also, what about small products that don't have a lot going on? Um, so I would, I can see how someone, we have a 14 page resume, but we're, we've been in business for almost eight years. So it takes a while to build. So what I would recommend is to go ahead and start one. And then when you feel like you have a critical mass of information that's worth sharing publicly, that's when you can kind of make it a, a public document. But also Emma's going to show different examples of fact sheets. So if you have a much smaller project and a more, or a tighter focus, um, to create a different kind of document to convey that information. Okay. Well, great. So that about ends the first question and answer section. Please make sure to keep your questions coming during the next session. And before we return, uh, we're going to go to a short commercial break. <laughs> Hi, folks. Did you know that Facebook is for more than posting cat pictures? You can post other things on Pinterest besides inspirational quotes. You can even tweet about more than just who dies next on your favorite TV show. Well, we use our social media outlets to tell you about upcoming events and also to make important announcements about the project. We have some great resources on our Pinterest page, and our LinkedIn network is steadily growing. Plus, it's a personal goal of mine to get more Twitter followers than George R. R. Martin. So come on down and check us out today. We now return to our webinar where Lori will tell us how to take care of our project resume. Well, thanks for those really good questions, and I, I think I am going to answer some of them, but if I don't, the ones that I kind of passed on, um, but if I don't, feel free to ask them again at the next question break. Um, so like having a pet, having a project resume is a commitment, and you have to give it regular attention. Maybe more like a houseplant, because it can withstand a little neglect, but if it's severely neglected, there is really no point in having it around, just forget about it. Uh, so I'm going to share my tips here uh, for keeping your project resume healthy and in good shape and ready for sharing at a moment's notice. So that question, who is responsible for developing and maintaining a project resume? Well, what do you think? Based on what you've seen and heard so far, whose job do you think it should be to do this work? So I'm going to ask you to use your marker tools here and mark the person you think have this job to start and maintain a resume. Okay, a lot of folks focusing in on the project manager, maybe a project PI, little involvement from the external evaluator. People are really honing in on that project manager role. Great. So any of these would be fine except, let's see if I can use my marker, except the, I'll just use this X, Don't, not, this, not this person, um, anybody except an external person. This is not a task for an, an evaluator, unless it's an internal one. It's not a task for an external evaluator. Because this resume maintenance is really an accountability function, and the external evaluator should not use his or her limited time on a project to compile a project resume. In fact, your external evaluator should be one of the main recipients of a project resume, so that that person doesn't have to slog through files and documentation and this and that to construct an account of what the project has been doing. My advice, as you see here, is to assign resume upkeep to a project staff person and make it a regular part of that person's job. Um, when you have a lot of people contributing, it tends to show up in terms of inconsistencies in style and formatting. And that's not necessarily a big deal as long as someone has final responsibility for making sure the resume is polished and professional looking. I'm also going to throw the question of when project resumes should be updated to you. So get ready to use your pull buttons this time. Is it best to update a resume at annual reporting time, quarterly, monthly, or whenever there's anything new to add to it? So you should have access to your pull buttons. Yep, people are using them. Give me a second. I see, see a lot of new answers coming through.
Okay, Mike, why don't you go ahead and show us the results? I know some answers are still coming in. Well, very good, except for those of you that didn't answer. Most everyone who did said D whenever there's anything new to add, which is exactly the point. It's a lot easier and safer to update it whenever you complete a deliverable or something in your project changes. That way you can be sure it's up to date. If you've ever had to scramble to update your own resume or Vita to apply for a job, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think when you're grant funded, you should always feel like you're constantly applying for continuation. You have to be able to continuously demonstrate accountability and achievement. An outdated resume just isn't useful. So keep it updated and it will serve you well. Okay, finally, where does your project resume go? If you have one, like we do, you'll find lots of places and uses, but there are definitely three key places it should go. You should make it easy to locate on the web. And I realize not all projects have websites, but it can even be linked from a personal web page, um, for example. Uh, include a link in your annual report. And you can, you can upload it into research.gov if you want to make absolutely sure your program officer sees it. And send a document or even just a link to, it, to your project advisors in advance of meetings. So get ready to use your marker tool again. Where should a project resume be located on a project website? So this is the image of our web menu. Um, so mark where you think it should, we should be housing ours, or this is very similar to a lot of project menus. Seeing about. Excellent. You got it. Um, so Emma actually did quite a bit of searching around as we were preparing for this webinar, and she found some resume type documents buried in lots of odd places. You don't want it buried. You don't want people to have to work to find it. You really want to show it off uh, if you've got it. So as you, as you figured out, ours is located right here in about. It's actually um, in our drop down menu, so it's super easy to find. So the person that was wanting to see the example um, that I had highlighted the screenshots of earlier, that's where you'll find it on our website. Um, if you want to take time to, to look for that. We have it in both PDF and um, HTML versions. When we updated, speaking of that, when we updated our website last year, we decided that instead of just including the resume on our site in a PDF form, which is what we used to do, that we'd make a web version, an HTML version, so we could make it more interactive. So I'm zooming in here so I can show you these are actually live links. Um, well, they would be. These are just screenshots. But on our website, they're, they're live links. So uh, we can actually click on, like this, this is webinar entries. We can click on the title, and it would actually go to the record for that webinar, which looks like this. And that enables anyone who's interested not only to use our resume to see our overall productivity, but to follow the links to go directly to our products and assess the quality of our work for themselves. As I noted, a project resume it's really a repository of information, and you can draw on it when writing your annual or other things. And you can also link to it, um, or you can either link to it or upload it into ResearchGov. I'll show you what we do. This is an example from our 2014 annual report, um, and it it's pretty typical narrative text here, talking listing our main deliverables. Um, then here is where I refer to our resume. And I actually do upload the document into research the rich.gov system to be sure that our program officer has ready access to it. And here's another example where I'm just talking about our contributors. And again, I refer to our project resume uh, if the reader is interested. And looking at that exhaustive listing of who's contributed to our work over the years. And the third key place to put your resumes is in front of your advisors. And this is an image of the first page of our agenda from our last National Visiting Committee meeting, which we just had. And under materials, as you can see here, I encourage our committee members to go to our webinar, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> not our webinar, our resume and check out uh, the information for themselves. So you know, from what I've already showed you, um, from our online resume, they can go directly to any of our deliverables from this resume document. 
So to learn more about project resumes, I would encourage you to read this article by Nick Smith, who happens to be the chair of our National Visiting Committee, um, co-authored with Barbara Florini. And this journal is open access, so you don't need a subscription to access the article. It's what inspired he inspired us, and we use this article as a foundation for developing our own um, project resume, as well as the project resume checklist that Emma created. So Jason, I am ready for our next question break. Okay, thanks, Sorry. So we're going to take a moment to answer your questions. Um, and right now I'd like you to, if you have any questions from that section, to type them into the chat box. Um, our, one of our major questions that we've heard before is, well, what if our project doesn't have a website? What do we do with the resume? How do we make it available? Well, I think, like I said, I think you can still find a way to get it online. Um, a lot of college faculty have their own like personal web page they can put their own Vita on. It could easily, even just in PDF form, be linked from there. Um, ATE Central is planning a really great resource that will be perfect for this. They're going to enable all projects to create um, what they call microsites, and those would be ideal places for posting project resumes. But I mean, even creating a simple WordPress site. It, it's not hard to create um, websites these days. I know sometimes you need to get approvals and everything, but I do think it's important to be able to, to have this information publicly accessible um, to support accountability. Okay, great. Uh, do you have to take care to get approvals for listing or identifying people on resume ahead of time? That could be an issue with uh, students possibly. Um, that would be something you'd have to check with your institution. The, the the folks that are on our resume are all professionals, and they're you know people who are on our webinar are cer that's certainly publicly available information through our website already. So I think it's worth looking into when you're talking about students. Um, but I don't have a definitive answer for that. Okay. Uh, if you're uploading your project resume with your annual report, uh, do you or are you able to shorten that annual report? I mean. Not yes and no. so not really because you still need to explain what's going on in your project and this is more it's more than just about those products you're creating those events you're you're hosting there's more to a report um, the main thing as I said before is it really makes that reporting easier it can actually reduce the amount of text you need to to do because um, you can pre you could refer to those I and mean, maybe you could size it in your annual report and then refer to the to the resume for a complete listing if there's a lot to include there, for example. But it doesn't really get you out of narrative reporting. It's a supplement. Um, and I think when you just need to show off what you've, you know, tangible outputs, what you've done, what you've created, um, you just want to update, uh, you know, stakeholders on what you've been up to, that's really where it comes in. It's really handy because I think you probably, you know, reading reports is not really how most of us want to spend our time reading lengthy narrative reports. And those examples I gave you of that, that wordy text, like we, we didn't need that information to get to the, to the bare facts of it. And that's really what I'm talking about. It's like when you don't need narrative, and you can just present it in a, in a factual kind, you know, listing kind of way, then take advantage of this format. Okay. Looks like we've reached the end of the questions. So before we move on, time for another commercial break. Did you know that Evaluate has a weekly blog that features content generated by users from around the AT community? That's right. We have had 25 posts contributed already and more just keep rolling in. This week's post is by Elaine Kraft from Mentor Connect and is titled Adapting Based on Feedback, Why Making Changes Based on Evidence is Important. You can also contribute a blog even if you're relatively new to the community. It's a great way to further your dissemination efforts. Your name could even appear on this slide. I will now turn it over to Emma, who is going to give us the facts about Project Fact Sheets. Well, thanks, Jason. In part three of this webinar, I will be sharing some things I learned about creating fact sheets. Before I go get into the creation of fact sheets, let's get oriented with them. So a fact sheet is a document containing detailed information about a product or service. So now I'm going to use the hand, uh, raise your hand button. So if you guys can go ahead and raise your hands if you have either read or created a fact sheet. This could be for a product. There we go, lots of answers. 
Good. So it seems like a lot of you are familiar with them. And so as you probably know, a fact sheet can be a great tool for your project. They're a simple way to share information with consumers. And as Lori mentioned in her section, a resume and fact sheet are not intended to replace a report, but they do help highlight and communicate information. So let's now review some fact sheets that I found um, while looking into them. While reviewing these fact sheets, imagine you are seeing them on a stack of paper in, in your office. Which fact sheet would you be interested in reading? Would this be a document you would pick up? How about this one? This one seems pretty interesting. And a final option. Using the marker tool that we used in the last section, circle the document that you would pick up and read. So go ahead and circle the document. Remember your marker tool is over on your left hand side. Yeah, exactly. So the one on the left um, consists of a lot of heavy text, and the message could actually be getting lost in there. The document on the right has shut its narrative and has only listed the vital information that the creator wants the audience to read. And it's very clear that you all would want to interact with this one too. So let's look at an example of this. Using your marker tool again, go ahead and highlight the section of text that is stating the percentage of minerals in the soil. Okay, go ahead and highlight it if you guys can find it. Okay, someone's highlighted down below. It's actually a percentage of weight. Yeah, so I'm actually going to go ahead and highlight for you guys, because as you can see, you're kind of waiting around the text. Let me use my pointer tool here. It's actually right here. Only about half of the soil volume consists of solid minerals, materials, sorry. So as you can see, you really had to wade through that. The important facts can get buried in the extra narrative. Yep, someone's highlighted it there in green. So let's shed that narrative. Okay, go ahead and try one more time. Highlight the percentage of minerals in the soil on this sheet. Use your marker tools again. Exactly. By shedding the narrative of this book chapter, the creators was able to boil down a two-page paragraph of dense text into a one-page fact sheet. You can easily digest this information without getting lost in the text. And as you guys can see, you easily found it. And yes, this was straight off of that page I just showed you. So now you can see how fact sheets really work to get your point across. So now that we go out over some benefits of using a fact sheet, let's explore some steps in creating one. For this section, I'm actually going to walk you through the steps I took in creating Evaluate's new webinar fact sheet that you can find on our website. In case you don't want to take copious notes throughout this section, we have created a handout that goes through all the steps that I'm about to show you, and it is available on our website as well in the webinar section. So the first step in creating a fact sheet is to choose a topic you will be covering and a title. I'll be sharing some content ideas at the end of this section in case you guys want some ideas. So for the Evaluate project, we decided to focus on our webinar series. As you can imagine, I'm sorry, Evaluate's webinar series has been running for six years, and this is actually our 30-second webinar that you all are all participating in. As you can imagine, collecting data from our webinar series resulted in a multi-page document with pages of text and charts, which is found on the left here. So the challenge was to turn a multiple-page text document into the document on the right, a one-page fact sheet, which would be easily distributed on both our website and at conferences we attend. So the next step after identifying your topic would be identifying sections within the fact sheet. When identifying sections for the fact sheet, think about your audience. If you are targeting your NSF program officer, what information is relevant to them? If you identify multiple audiences, consider making multiple versions of similar fact sheets rather than combining into one. For our webinar fact sheet, we decided on reach, webinar topics, and feedback. And these obviously will vary for your fact sheets. Next, you need to select two to three elements per section. Keep the information clear and concise. Don't try to force information onto one page. Rather, select the most vital information and include that on your fact sheet. So now that you have your topic, title, sections, and elements selected, you'll take a few minutes to sketch out your fact sheet on just a regular piece of paper. Share this with your colleagues to make sure the information makes sense and the layout works. 
You may be tempted, but don't skip this step. It will save you time when creating the document electronically. Next, you'll choose your software to create your fact sheet. Any of these platforms here will work. Add in additional graphic elements and charts where appropriate. And use your project or institutional colors. So let's take a look at how the Evaluates webinar fact sheet turned out. Here is the initial sketch that I made. And now let's see the final product. Here it is. By shutting the extra narrative and including a few graphic elements, I created a document that is easy for our consumers to digest. Now we have a one-page document that is perfect to share with our NSF program officer to show how our webinar series is impacting the ATE audience. So are you interested in creating a fact sheet? But maybe you aren't sure that your project has any potential content? Let's look at some content areas for your projects. Are you a new project and don't have enough information for a resume or a larger document, such as Lori covered in her section? Well, a fact sheet would make a great one to two page document to distribute at the ATEPI conference or outreach events. You could use information from your proposal, include a project mission if applicable, and highlight a few of the things your project will be pursuing. This is an example here on the right. Maybe you have multiple elements or deliverables on your project. If so, you can magnify one of those just like we did here at Evaluate with our webinar series. Or maybe you just received your evaluation results back from your external evaluator. Well, you can turn those into a fact sheet to show your advisory committee. Here's an example from the ATE community. The Marine Advanced Technology Education Center, MATE, made a two-page fact sheet highlighting their evaluation results. By boiling down their evaluation results into a two-page document, the consumer reads the information you choose versus translating the findings on their own. This is by no means an exhaustive list of potential content. And if you're still not sure about what content to include or just want to look at some other examples, check out our fact sheet board on our Evaluate's Pinterest page. Viewing some of these pins can help give you ideas for fact sheet content or designs. I hope that this has inspired you to create your own project fact sheet. I'll now turn the webinar back over to Jason for questions and answers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emma. That was a great presentation on fact sheets. And we have a couple of questions. So first of all, if I wanted to design my own fact sheet, is there a fact sheet checklist? Well, the document that I showed you um, about not taking copious notes that is posted on our website. And that is actually the steps that I took in creating um, the Evaluate Webinar fact sheet that was shown, uh, the example that was shown throughout. Um, so that actually walks you through the, the steps that I just covered and would be a great place for you to start. Emma will be putting that link in the chat box shortly. Also, what are some good inexpensive sources of graphics for your fact sheets? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. And actually, Google has made it very easy um, for you to find some free graphics. Um, if you go to Google, you can actually go to the um, search area and um, select graphics that are actually um, commercially licensed for your free use. Um, so that's a great source. Um, here at the Evaluate Project, since we do um, have a lot of webinars and use a lot of graphics, we actually have um, use iStock photo. Um, it is a little bit pricier, um, but if you are intending on using the graphic elements a lot, I would really recommend that site. It's iStock photo, um, and they have some great sources. And it really depends on the um, it depends on the icon. Um, I see Max Simus asked how much, and it really just depends on what you need. Um, their prices kind of range based on the quality of the icon or photo you're selecting. But there's some great sources out there. Again, just go to Google and you can select um, that free free for commercial use, and then those would all be free for your use. Okay, great. Well. Uh, so you showed several software programs. What ones do you use specifically? 
Well, it's actually a great question. And um, I showed two documents in this part three section of the webinar. Um, the first was that basic sheet about how to create a fact sheet, and that I use a Microsoft Publisher for. I use that program if I'm doing anything text-oriented, um, designing just like basic text sheets like that. For this specific um, webinar fact sheet that I created, I did use Adobe, Adobe Illustrator, um, but either Microsoft Word or PowerPoint um, could both be used um, to create these fact sheets as well. Okay. What about the evaluate survey fact sheet? Regarding the design of it? Yes. Um, that is actually in Microsoft Word. Okay. All right. Well, uh, looks like we've got several recommendations there in the uh, chat box for some places to go uh, to do the uh, graphic design for these uh, sheets. Lori, before we wrap up, do you have any other comments on fact sheets or naked report? Okay. Well, very good. Uh, so before we wrap up, you may be thinking to yourself, wow, I'd love to continue this conversation, but I'm just not sure how to. I know you did. Well, guess what? We have a way to continue that conversation. I'd like to take you uh, this opportunity to tell you about our uh, Twitter chat, which is happening on May 20th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time using the hashtag NakedEval. So all you have to do is go onto Twitter and find that hashtag uh, at 1 o'clock on May 20th, and you'll see uh, some questions posted and some discussion prompts. To reply, just use hashtag NakedEval. Um, Twitter chat are like networking events without the dress code. Also, our next webinar will happen on June 10, 2015, and that's checklists for improving evaluation practice. So the registration is open, and we already have a few people registered uh, for that webinar. As we wind down our time together, and before you go back out into the real world, please take a moment to tell us what you think about this webinar. It will help us to tailor future content, and it will help us to provide you with the best experience we can in the future. We're going to leave that survey open. Moderators, remember, don't close that window on your screen. And while you're working on this, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Lori and Emma, I'd also like to thank you for sharing your wisdom on fact sheets with us today. On behalf of all of us at Evaluate, thank you so much for being with us. Have a great day.